Okay. Okay, we're live. Well, welcome everybody tonight to uh, Christian Center Shreveport on our live uh, stream tonight on our Wednesday night online uh, service. And we're blessed today, tonight, I mean beyond measure. Uh, Dr. Robert Heidler from Glory of Zion Ministry has agreed to come on tonight and talk to us and uh, give us some insight. We really feel like tonight with the issues that's going on in the nation and in the earth, that his revelation uh, that he birthed back in October about the year of the mouth is very, very important for this season. And we kind of want to talk to him about it and about what that, how he got the revelation, number one, but two, what do we do with such a revelation? You know, we have a revelation that's supposed to last an entire year. So what do you do with that kind of word? You know, sometimes we have seasonal words or, or a moment word but now we have a yearly word. And so we think this is a very important topic. So I want to introduce tonight, if you, most of y'all know Dr. Heidler, if you watch uh, Chuck Pierce, you know, we're connected to them. So we, we watch him all the time. We read all his books, but uh, he's been at uh, Glory of Zion for quite a few years now. He served as Dean of their Issachar school and their, their Institute there. Uh, he's graduated from South Florida. We'll, we'll say that's okay, Dr. Heiler, and from Dallas Theological. When I read that on your bio, I thought, how did you end up at Glory of Zion? And that, that may be a question we can answer later. And he got his doctorate from Wagner Leadership Institute. Him and his wife are teachers, and they travel, and he's written many books. And I don't even want to, I can't even read them all. I just encourage you to go to uh, Glory of Zion's website and look at all the books, Some my favorites that I think you and Chuck co-authored especially was restoring your shield of faith, but also the time to advance, the time to prosper. I literally use that like a manual, you know, cause you, you have the months in there and I look at them every month and I revisit it and I actually use some up to help teach our people. And then I think, I know you've done the Iona books, but your book about um, the apostolic church and uh, rising is one of the best books, especially on the early church and, the activity of the early church and what was going on there. And it's a real asset to you as a leader. If you're a leader tonight, a pastor, I encourage you. I actually, Dr. Heidler, I incorporate that in my newcomers class because it's such a good foundational teaching and it's, it's, it's scholarly, but yet it's able to, I can still relate to it to the people. And I think they like that as well. So I just encourage you to go buy everything that Dr. Heidler has ever produced and uh, make him a very wealthy <laughs> man. So we welcome you tonight. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Heidler. I appreciate this. Well, it's really good to be here, Tim. I appreciate the invitation. And, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite topics to uh, talk about what God is doing prophetically in the earth. Uh, at Glory of Zion, we talk a lot about what we call the Issachar anointing because it says that the sons of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Yeah. And I believe that is what God wants to raise up in our day. He wants to raise up a generation that understands the times so we can know what God's people should do. And I, I want to honor you and Chuck and your whole team because I think right now in this crisis, especially y'all have been the, one of the top leaders in the world because uh, everybody's watching you because now everybody's got access to the internet or they're watching the internet more than any other time. And because y'all put out so much prophetic content and accurate prophecies, uh, you're letting everybody know what time it is and how to advance in this season. And that has just been a beautiful thing. Well, let me, let's get to our topic tonight. I want to talk about the year 5780. Every year you do a teaching on the Hebraic year. And I, I've been following it as long as you've been doing it. And I, I mean, I'm there taking notes when you're teaching it. Because I want to position myself and my people, the people I pastor and lead, as to what God's going to do for that entire year. And, and I know you're a great teacher. That's your gift. You're, you have the, have the fivefold. You're a teacher. But I, I, I'm interested to, to ask you this question. How do you move from being a teacher into bringing such prophetic revelation for an entire year? How did that process grow in you that you took it from, okay, I'm going to study this, but now I see what God's going to do for an entire year? 
Well, I have lots of help. I don't do it by myself. Uh, usually coming up on the beginning of the year, uh, my wife, Linda, will start to study the Hebrew letter. Uh, we look to see what, what the letter originally meant. Every Hebrew letter was originally a picture. It not only has a sound, it has a meaning. Um, and so like the letter pay, the letter for, that were for this year uh, was originally a picture of a mouth. The early Oaks pictograph just looks like a mouth. And so it is the year of the mouth. But then my wife will go through and over the course of about three months, she goes through every Hebrew word that starts with that letter. For pay, it was about 600 of them. And she cuts and pastes from the uh, concordance and comes up with a list of them. And then she goes through and categorizes them. There's some that are the names of people, some that are the names of countries. Uh, and looking through it, it's like there are, you see a pattern, you see cer certain meanings repeated over and over and over again. And so she comes up with this incredible uh, document that has all the words for the year and they're categorized. And so what we do then, I, I like to go through that and just pray down through it. And what I find happening is, uh, it, it's sort of like when you read the scriptures and you get a rhema word, there's a, a, a verse that just jumps off the page and you know God is saying that. And so that's what we do as we go through this. There's certain things that God just seems to highlight. And after we've gone through that whole process, then we get together with Chuck who is just incredibly prophetic. And we say, well, so Chuck, what are you here for the year? And so he goes through what he's hearing and it always lines up perfectly with what we found in the Hebraic letters. Wow. And so coming out of that then, uh, it comes together as a message. This is what God is saying for the year. But it's, uh, people say, what book do you get that from? We say, well, it comes from the Bible, but it takes a lot of work. <laughs> but it's we have just seen the first one of the first years we did it until just as an illustration there were two hebrew letters for the word year one was the samic and the other was a hey and the samic looks like a circle and it was originally a, that's a picture of a circle or a cycle and words that began with cycle were to go around to surround and carry out that meaning the hay was originally a picture of a window. And the hay was the sound that the wind makes blowing through a window lattice. And so the, the words that begin with the hay were, were roar, whisper, there was a lot of sound words with the sound the wind, winds make. And so you put those together and it was the year of the circle and the wind. And I thought, wow, this is gonna be the year of the circling wind it's going to be the year of the world. End. Well, that year, there were more hurricanes worldwide than the world had ever seen. Uh, they ran out of hurricane names and started using Greek letters. That was the year of Katrina. And it was like, it was the year of the whirlwind. And it was all right there in the, in the scriptures. Oh, what, what's it, let me ask you this, what's it like when you put out a word like that and then all of a sudden you see it? I mean, that has to almost like, I don't say freak you out, but it has to be like, wow. You know, I did hear the Lord, number one, but it's being fulfilled in the whole earth. And I mean, what's that like to feel that when you see that? It's very humbling. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, a, it's, I'm very thankful to know that God wants us to understand the times that we're living in. Right. There was another another year, the letter meant to flood, and there were a lot of words about flooding. We were on a trip to Ireland, and we landed, and after we landed, we got a phone call from back home, and it was Chuck's brother, Keith, and he said, after your flight took off, it started to rain, and it poured for hours, everything in Denton flooded, and your house flooded. And my first thought is, well, that's that's what this year is about. And God brought blessing even through that, but it was like, we just knew that was, we, we were in the Lord's timing. 
in the you know, what I like about it is then you're not so much surprised by what's right. happening during that season. It's like, God, you told me this was going to happen. So when crises happen, like the winds, that, like you say, whatever, then it's like, okay, I know this is the Lord. You know, I know he's up to yeah. something. I, I, you know, I, you, if you watched my, my episode last week when I was on Chuck's, when I was in Ukraine, the Lord told me a war was coming to tell the people to prepare them and why. So when the war came, the people didn't lose hope. They go, okay, God, yeah. you got a plan in this. So that's what you're seeing, isn't it? Yeah. God doesn't want us to be surprised by everything that happens. And uh, he, he prepares us. He gives us insight and revelation. And if you're staying in step with the spirit, I, I believe you can prosper in any season. Amen. I think what you're, you may have never heard this term, but I call it parabolic prophecy or being a parable uh, giver. Cause you're really doing that with your pictures and your frames of what you're saying. It, it becomes very prophetic. Uh, it's a parable. You have to look for it. And I say, Chuck is that way. Anyway, when I first started listening to Chuck's prophecies, I'm like, they don't make any sense, you know? And then all of a sudden, cause he speaks in mysteries at times, you know, when he says something like watch the wind and Katrina hits, you know, I didn't know that that was what he meant by that. But, but uh, I think that's where it's, it's to honor a King to search out a matter, you know, Proverbs 25 tells us that. And I think what you've done in, in honoring the Lord is to search out a matter. And when God has given us pictures and the Hebrew language is amazing. I've studied Hebrew language for years and the letters, the way they're written, the shapes, I, I do the same thing you're doing, but y'all take it. I like what you said that you just feel the, the, I call it the wind. You feel the anointing on it that when it's something, okay, this is one. So there has to be a way of filtering because there, there's obviously some of them you go, I don't know that. How do you do that? How do you filter in and out of that? Uh, well, like I say, it's like, it's like when you're reading the scripture and you get a rhema word and you're going down through a passage and all of a sudden there's a verse it just jumps off the page and you know that God is speaking that it may not have, even have anything to do with the original context, but that's something God is speaking. And that's what happens as we're studying through the letters for the year. It's like the, the Holy Spirit just sort of activates and you say, God is saying that. And, and then a lot of times God begins to give revelation of what that means. And, uh, well, I think you also, you guys are fulfilling a mandate that's, you know, that we all see in part and you're taking the whole parts and making a whole, I think sometimes prophetic people feel like they have to have the whole picture. And, and I think y'all demonstrate as a team ministry uh, yeah. that no, it's all of us together. And by two or three is the word confirmed. So you're actually confirming the word specific. Cause I, I saw Linda, do that teaching about how she brought it in and Chuck would come in and it'd be exactly what you guys got. I imagine that meeting's a pretty exciting meeting when y'all <laughs> come together and it all fits together. I imagine yeah. a lot of surge of the spirit in that meeting. Yeah, it really is. And I think it's a good picture of fivefold ministry working together. I mean, yes, uh, just have apostles or just the prophets or just teachers. You don't really get the dynamic that when all of those gifts begin to work together, uh, there's just the fullness of revelation that comes forth. That's good. Well, let me ask you this as somebody that I, I, you have, and I don't know that you realize how much you're leading the body of Christ and you and Chuck and everybody, but especially this once a year, I know so many of my friends in ministry and everybody like they, they may not watch glory Zion all year, but they're going to watch that head of the year because they're trying to feel the pulse of what God is saying. That's at Issachar knew the time and season they're trying to hear and it, it'll direct their path for the entire year. So when you watch the body of Christ around the world, take in this revelation, does that drive you for more revelation? Does it make you fearful? Well, I mean, I'd want to know for you from your standpoint, what's it like to watch the body of Christ grasp it and run with it? Uh, I'm just very happy to see the body of Christ seeking out revelation and wanting to flow in it because uh, i know that's that's the whole reason god gives it he wants his body to flow in his revelation to understand the times and to be able to succeed in what he's called him to do yeah and i think uh chuck's i don't know how y'all came up with the the judah I, I, you know issachar and zebulun and uh, teaching that you do and i use that now as i travel as well when i minister because you know, that Issachar really directs how Judah goes forth. 
And then also we see the provision at the end. It literally comes to pass. When you follow this pattern, it is a biblical pattern. That's one thing I love about the Old Testament. You know, a lot of people, oh, it's a law, it's rules. I'm telling you, there's some beautiful patterns in there. And if we'll follow those patterns, it'll change our lives and change the walk. That we, do, you, do you find that to be true? Absolutely, yeah. You know, um, Jesus never talked down about the Old Testament. He just called it the scriptures. And the apostle Paul did too. And he says, what was written before was written for our learning, which means God wants us to know what's there because there's stuff we need. Amen. Amen. Well, let's talk about the 5780 and how it applies to today. The Lord shared with you back in October and the whole team put it together. And this pay, uh, I know it has a, the numeric value 80. So that's where we get the 5780. But uh, the pay is it comes forth. And um, in this mouth thing, when you saw the mouth, you saw what it represents. So if I'm a person, I'm watching that, I'm listening to that. How do I take that revelation? Okay, now I just want to go around and talk. I want to declare. I think I understand that's not really what you guys are trying to say. You're just saying that there's more anointing on that this year. I mean, what are you? what is the, the point of that one, especially on 5780? Why don't you talk about that revelation? Well, it's interesting coming into 5780, we've come out of a decade where the letter was an ion which was an I. I is actually the Hebrew word for I. And so that was a decade where God wanted us to learn to see. He wanted to increase our vision. This decade goes from seeing to speaking. And you look at the pay words, and so many of them are to speak, to breathe. Uh, but words that uh, carry forth that idea of, of, of speaking forth. And the, the passage God took me to there was uh, Jeremiah, when uh, he said, Lord, what, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sufficient to do what you call me to do. And God said, you'll, you'll go to whoever I tell you to go to, and you will speak what I tell you to speak. Because when you speak my words into the earth realm, things will change. And I feel like that's what God is saying to us, that it's, it's a year to decree. I mean, we're seeing the world has gone absolutely crazy. People are, uh, men's hearts are failing them for fear for what's coming on the earth. And in the midst of all that shaking, God wants his church to be unshakable. He wants us to know what God is saying. He wants us to know what God is doing. And uh, he wants us to speak his word into that that will change situations. And uh, personally, I believe this is one of the most exciting times because I think when everything around us is shaking, they're gonna look to see, well, what's solid? What is real? What is reliable? And I, I believe we are going to be ushered into one of the most incredible times of revival the world has ever seen. And I think the mouth, obviously, everything God created was with the mouth. I think for us as, yeah. human, as humans, that's what makes us different than the animal is our speech. Yeah. And when you, I think the, the sages say the rabbis talk about how the uniqueness of when God created us, one of the terms is he made us with speech to be able to speak into, or into things in the earth. And I think that's what we have got to see in this season. Here we are in a crisis. And it's not just, a, I, I, for me, I, I got involved in the word of faith movement when I came out of Bible college and you know, I was just quoting, claiming everything, you know, whatever scripture popped in my brain, I just would quote it. And, I, and that's okay. I'm not saying it's wrong. But when I started growing in the Lord and got into prophetic, I started, well, you know, it seems that when God tells me he's saying something, it makes a bigger difference than when I just quote stuff. And I, I don't know how to, I didn't know always how to navigate around that. But to me, this is in right now, like you said, the I and before us. Yeah. is what we see is what we should say, not what we, we shouldn't just say what comes in our brain, but what we're seeing in the spirit. And I think that Jeremiah, you know, after that encounter in Jeremiah one, when he tells him to plant and pluck up everything, he says to him, okay, now what do you see? And he tells him, well, I see the branch of an almond tree. And the Lord says to him, you see very well. So it's almost like his first prophecy class was say what you see. And I think that's something I think I, I want to ask your question about that. So as seers in this season, uh, how do we move from what we see to our mouth and declare that? How would you teach that? Well, there's a verse in Lamentations where Jeremiah writes, 
Who can speak and have it happen unless the mouth of the Lord has spoken it? So we can't just say whatever comes into our minds and expect it to happen. But if we hear God, if we see what God is saying, if we hear what the word of the Lord is, then when we take the word of the Lord and release it into the atmosphere, then things change. And, I, and what I've found with your word this year, uh, literally, when you hear, it's almost like there's less delay. You know, sometimes there's a delay. You declare something, months may go by, a year may go by. But right now, we seem to be in a season as the Lord says it, and then we speak it, it begins to happen immediately. Is that what you feel the anointing yeah. is on this year? Yeah. Uh, a good example of that actually was from several years ago. But uh, back when Saddam Hussein was overthrown and our, our troops went in, we conquered the land, but nobody knew what happened to Saddam Hussein. And so they did a search for the country, one of the most intensive manhunts in history. For nine months, they searched for Saddam Hussein. Nobody could find him. I was with Chuck at a conference in San Antonio and actually Dutch, speak, Dutch Sheets was uh, speaking on the platform. And in the middle of Dutch's message, Chuck jumped up, went up on the stage and took the microphone. He said, God just spoke to me. And he said, Saddam Hussein will be captured within seven days. This is the word of the Lord. And so he released it into the atmosphere. Chuck went, came and he sat back down. He was literally shaking. He said, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> but that's what God told me. Saddam Hussein was captured that week. Actually, Chuck said he will be captured this week, no matter what hole he's hiding in. And that was after nine months of search. Wow. That was, he was found. And I believe, really believe that when Chuck released that prophetic word into the atmosphere, God did what was necessary to bring it about. And I feel, I feel like that's when we hear God, when we know we've heard what God is saying and we release it into the atmosphere, then God will be very quick to bring that about. Would you say the 5780 year, the word of the mouth is, I mean, obviously God's anointing is always the same, but do you feel like it's just heightened in this season? Is that what you feel? Yeah, I think each each year, I mean, God never changes. His right. truth is always there. But I think his seasons change. And as the seasons change, God focuses on different things. God emphasizes different things. And so I feel like that is the, the focus that, uh, that he has now. The other thing, this is also the year of the face. Panim is a pay word. And it's a year God wants to meet with us face to face. He wants us to seek his face. And um, as we do that, we're going to see his anointing released. Oh, good. I, that, that, that leads me into a question I wanted to ask you later, but I'm going to ask you now. Okay. Um, uh, Moses was different than the prophets. He was different than everybody else in his season. I think even prior to this, the, the pandemic that we've been in, we, we gave a word, and I think you guys did too, about how Moses had to turn aside. I think it's in uh, Exodus there where he went aside and God gave him instruction on how he's going to deliver the, the Jews out of Egypt. And so he had different encounters. And in, in Numbers chapter 12, it talks about, you know, prophets have dreams and there's uh, visions and then there's riddles and dark sayings. But with Moses, I speak mouth to mouth. And we've been prophesying that for over a year now that this is a year for uh, us to move the prophetic level from not, I love dreams and visions. We teach that and we function in that. And we always will. But this to me, when I read that years and years ago, I thought that's a different level of anointing to communicate. And, and for you to be mouth to mouth, you have to be face to face. And yeah. I think that played into what you just said there. So in your understanding of what that encounter would be, what, why do you think God used that term mouth to mouth there? And I think it's very appropriate this year, 5780, and it should be something we're desiring, but the face to face, do you see the same thing? Yeah, I feel like God wants us to, when we're face to face with him, um, he's able to express himself to us and through us. And, um, it brings us to a new level of intimacy with him and a new level of 
understanding of what he's doing. And his mouth. And it was interesting also about that, that uh, encounter, because you remember God tells him to speak, go to Pharaoh, say this and that, and tell the people. And he said, well, you know, I got, I got speech problems. I, I don't know it, but the Lord said, no, I'll be the one that speaks through you. And what's interesting when you study that 80 pay to speak, but uh, it was when you add, he said, I'm basically saying, I am the God that will speak through you. And actually when you do the Hebrew, it comes up 81. So it may be something that God's trying to do next year as well as us to know that God, the I am is speaking through us. And even Moses was 80 when that happened. I thought that was really interesting when he got that word from the Lord. So here we are at this, this place. So, I mean, where do you think we are right now uh, with this word in time? Cause Chuck keeps telling us, and we've been declaring as well that we're about to have a real Passover. I mean, a real pe a Pentecost. So if you're going to give instructions, a teacher to the church, the body of Christ whole coming into Pentecost, what are our declarations? What should they be in this season? Well, uh, you know, God told us this year that all of the feasts were going to come with a whole new, uh, a whole new significance, a whole new level of reality. And we definitely saw that at Passover. I mean, that was at the time where everybody was saying, go into your house and shut the door uh, and, that's what we did. We had, and, and for the first time, almost everyone I knew put blood on the doorpost or something red on the doorpost. It was like we need to really enter into this in reality. Uh, I think Pentecost is the next step after Passover. Passover, you get redemption, but Pentecost is a celebration of God's provision. It was the uh, first fruits of the wheat harvest. It was when God gave Torah on Mount Sinai. It was when the Holy Spirit was given out. And I believe there's there's a new anointing or something fresh that God wants to pour out in the earth this year at Pentecost. And so I, I'm not, I don't claim to know what that looks like or what that is, but I believe we're going to see a new release from God in his church this year. Well, I was hoping you'd give us some insight of what you're going to teach about Pentecost. <laughs> so Chuck's probably not watching, so you can tell us now. But uh, we'd love to know um, that process. When you put together a word like 5780, I mean, how many how many hours? What What's the process for you? Because I think that's important for the, the common believer to know that you're not just spending a couple of days and putting a word out there. <laughs> You, you, you labor over that word, don't you? Uh, and of course, then as a yeah. teacher, I know you got to condense it to enough uh, to fit in a time frame. Yeah, that's literally the, the hardest message I do all year. Usually it will take about a month to put the message together after, after getting the input from Chuck and after getting the understanding of the Hebrew words. But it's really uh, seeing what is God emphasizing, what is God saying, um, and yeah, it, it's, um, it's a time where you really have to press in to hear what God is saying. But, um, at the same time, God so wants us to get that understanding. He wants us to do that. And so, um, there is just a, it's like you're living in a flow of revelation while he's doing that. Well, I want to say, I want to honor you as a teacher because, I mean, you got to make mud clear, you know, you got to take a stuff that's a huge topic with tons of information as a teacher. I know teachers, they can't get enough information. So they download, they download, download, but then they have to process it out that it's digestible for the listener. And I think you do a great job of how you condense it. And it, it's, it's meaty. I mean, I, there's something I love about you, what you teach is you can walk away from that. And I think sometimes, a teacher can do that. I remember Lance Wall now, we brought him in one time. We had all the prophets, Bob Jones and all, and they all speak in mystical terms and all over the place. And, and then Lance come up and he taught, he took the prophetic and taught it. And I had, I had men come up to me and go, now that I can do, you know, it's basically, <laughs> you know, when these prophets yeah. are talking, yeah. I, and they speak in mysteries and they speak in abstracts and I don't understand, especially for left brain people, you know, we need some structure of like, how do we do it? It's the administration. So I feel like you're an administrator of the prophetic. Do you see yourself as that? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, for, for years, when Chuck first came to the church, he would usually speak once a month. 
it would be so prophetic, your spirit would just be going crazy listening to it. But a lot of the people were saying, so what did he say? <laughs> I would take the next three weeks and take that revelation and teach it. And people say, oh, now I see it. But the, the, the revelation prophetically had to come first. But then as a teacher, I could administrate that and take it and people could really gain understanding of it. Well, I think that's that's a gift because I asked Lance that one time, Lance, when he was here with us, I said, how do you do that? And he goes, you know, I'm really not that prophetic. I can listen to the prophet and I understand what needs to be said for the church to understand. Is that that what happens? Is that what happens to you? Yeah, that's very similar. So if you would. Uh, I don't consider one- myself to be a prophet. I mean, I, I, I hear God because everybody hears God, but I'm not I'm not a prophet. I'm a teacher. Yeah. But uh, I love I love to work with prophets. Gotcha. I love- why don't you speak to that? Why don't, well, there's there's teachers that are watching right now. Um, they have a gift of teaching and they feel out of place in a prophetic house. Why don't you speak to teachers right now and say how, how you've done it, but how they can actually interact and be a part of a prophetic house? Well, I think one of the big problems in the church is that everybody feels more comfortable with people who are like them. And so you get a church where it's all teaching. You get a church that's all prophetic. And that was never God's plan. God says we need to be knit together. All of these gifts need to be operating. And what I find is if I'm just teaching and there's no prophetic there, people just shrivel up and die. Mm. Because teaching will do that for you if that's all you have. But if I'm in a prophetic house and I'm the teaching gift is flowing together with the prophetic, Wherever the prophetic is, there's just a flow of life. And so it adds a whole new dimension to teaching when the teacher and the prophet are ministering together. So when you hear like Chuck gets up there and of course he's a machine gun prophet. I mean, he just like, you know, he just shoots them out there and I love it. But when you hear something that something that goes off inside of you and go, that needs to be taught on. Is that what happens? Is that what leads you in place of laying some foundational teaching? Yeah, uh, actually, Chuck will you, usually on Monday, I'll say, Chuck, what do you feel like I need to teach on? And based on what he's hearing, he'll, he'll give me an assignment to teach on it. And a lot of times he'll tell me to teach on something. And I'll be like, I have no idea what that means. I have no idea how to teach that. But what I've seen is if he assigns it, God will begin to give revelation. And by the end of the week, I have a message on it. But so it's the prophet and the teacher working together. And the, the end result is an anointing that I would never have had on my own. Right. So what do you see? And this is probably, I don't know if you have an answer for this, but what you guys are demonstrating, and we try to do the same, same with teaching, I mean, with uh, team ministry, why don't we see more of that in the body of Christ as a whole, where we see the five focus? Usually if you have a, a teacher that's leading the congregation, it's a teacher driven ministry. If you have a mm-hmm. prophet leading, if you, whatever, you know, whatever their fivefold office is, but you guys have demonstrated how long did it take to get to that? And, and why do you think we're not seeing that in the body of Christ as a whole? I think a lot of people are threatened by gifts that are different than theirs. I mean, a prophet does not understand a teacher, usually. Usually a, a prophet will think, teaching, who needs that? Let's just hear what God is saying. And the teacher will say, prophets, they're just flaky. You never know what they're going to say. It's not. And so the, the, there's like a barrier between them. And they don't realize that uh, we need each other. God designed the, the, the church to be knitted together where all of the gifts are operating. And when that happens, you, you see just a, an explosion of anointing and you see the, the Holy Spirit working. But and you'd, never, you'd never get that if it's just individual, you know, all the prophets get together over here and all the teachers get together over here. And God said, no, we need in Acts, I think 13, it describes the church in Antioch. It says in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and there were teachers. 
that's one of the biggest miracles in the New Testament. You had the prophet <laughs> and teachers working together, and it created an apostolic center that changed the world. Absolutely. And in 1 Corinthians 12, when it lists as apostles and prophets and teachers, you know, there's not pastors not listed there. Oh. And I think we've gotten that way out of order. Uh, and, and, and they call me pastor, but, you know, I don't really consider myself a pastor per se. I know how to love people and shepherd them. Yes. But really the fivefold is what we're after the apostolic building, uh, the training centers and equipping people to do the work of the ministry. That's our passion. And we're building that. And, and for me, looking outside, looking into what you guys are doing, and that's what we see. And so it's a great modeling. My heart is that it would grow. I think it's going to the, the top leader, the set leader, whoever that would be, they have to be humble enough and, and their ego can't be so big that they don't allow anybody else to have a place. And I imagine, and for you, go ahead. What God has been doing is establishing prototypes. Uh, I think your church, Glory of Zion, I, I see a number of churches where fivefold ministry is finally beginning to operate. And it has such an anointing that comes forth that I think uh, other churches can look at that and say, oh, I see how that works now. I think we need to do that too. Because until somebody sees it, it's really hard to get a vision of how that would work. But and especially, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, you were mentioning apostles, prophets, and teachers. And it says, once you have all those, th those three together, then come miracles and healings and all the rest. So where those three gifts are operating together, it releases all the gifts to function. Wow. That's, that's good counsel right there, because uh, here we want to see signs and wonders and miracles. And every pastor wants to see that. Every leader wants to see that. But there, there's, again, there's another pattern. It is a pattern. I don't, I think of Dick Rubin, if you remember Dick Rubin, he would always say when the pattern's right, the glory will fall. And I think that's so true. Do you agree with that? Yeah. You see, when Moses built the tabernacle, he got everything in place. And when it was all finished, there was the glory. I have a funny question for you. Okay. I, watch, I watch your services a lot. I can't imagine what it's like for you to sit there as a teacher and watch 50 prophets come up there and prophesy and wonder, you know, well, what's my portion here? I mean, how do you do that? How do you find your place in a meeting like that or in gatherings like that where there's so much prophecy and you as a teacher just having to stand in the middle of all that? Well, <clears throat> I just love prophets. And, you know, I, I, to the, I've gotten to the point where I can say, well, that one's a little off and this one's not right, but that one is really good. And I think what holds it together is Chuck because he's not only prophetic, but he's an apostle. And I, I know that I have my assignment from him. And so I just flow in, uh, in that assignment and I can enjoy all the prophetic that's, that's flowing around me. That, that's good. And so all of your teachers, and I, I think that's true. I think for administrators too, the gift of administration, uh -huh. it's hard because uh, for me, when I, when I started my ministry, I was so prophetic and everybody that I brought, I brought only brought prophets to the house. We never brought anybody apostolic or anybody else, a few teachers every once in a while. And we were so full of revelation. I mean, we, our brains were falling out, but we weren't building anything. Uh, mm -hmm. because we just were, this is what God's going to do. And this is what he's going to do. And this is what he's going to do. Well, somebody has to build it. And I, yeah. I do you find that, that is that, I see that at Gloria Zion. Y'all are building things, aren't you? Well, this is how I see the fivefold ministry. You start with the evangelist because they get people saved, but when people get saved, they need to be nurtured. They need to be cared for. And so you have the pastor and the pastor is like the nurse in the delivery room that takes the newborn baby and swaddles it and makes sure it's healthy. The trouble with a lot of churches, it never goes further than the pastor. The people have been saved for 30 years and the pastor is still patting them on the head and making sure they're safe and healthy. And, and so that's why you need prophets. And the prophet will speak into that and say, well, I'm glad you're cared for and you're comfortable, but you've got a call of God on your life. Let me tell you, 
what God has for you. And where, wherever prophetic ministry flows, people get highly motivated. They get excited. They get vision. But a lot of times they don't know what to do with it. And that's where the teachers come in. And the teachers say, here's how you do that. Let me show you how your gift works. Let me show you how to develop in your, uh, your gifting, your ministry. And then the apostle's there, and he's the one that set the whole thing in order so that it works. And then he sends forth people out into ministry. And the result is people don't stay babies, but they grow and they develop. And the church becomes a mighty army in the earth. Wow. Well, what a great picture. And I think you, you guys did that this year with the 5780 word, is you took that word and you fostered it, you blessed it, you took care of it, you nurtured it, you made sure it was very clear, make the message clear, the vision clear, you wrote it down so we could run after it. So here we are in probably the worst crisis in my lifetime, uh, it seems, but now I know I have a weapon uh, the word that's in my mouth, if I can hear and see prophetically, then I can change the culture. I can change the situation. I think Chuck's saying, you know, when his word was there at Passover, it'd start lifting 30 days later, it'd be gone. I, I mean, I heard one of the former who uh, of the who uh, world health organization yesterday, former doctors there. Uh, he said something yesterday. He was like, he was shocked. He goes, this thing is like disappearing. He said, it's, it's astounding. You know, they expected this second wave and the growth of it. No, I'm not saying people still aren't sick because they are, but the, the predictions that they're not happening. And I think it's because you guys took the mouth you began and not you. I mean, there's a lot of others that did as well, but you began to declare that. Is that how you see this gifting work when we have a word of the Lord like that? Yeah. I think when the, when the Lord says, uh, this is the time, you know, when Chuck gave that word after Passover, you're going to see this decline. And so we just started praying that the intercessors began to stand on that. And um, we've seen it happen. It, it is amazing. So what are you seeing on the horizon? What, what, what's the Lord speaking to you right now? Where are we headed after Pentecost? So we know Pentecost is going to be a real Pentecost. We're going to have another impartation. I mean, I'm seeing some things on the horizon that aren't, that aren't all great. Uh, but yet I have this confidence that God is going to empower us and give us what we need for what's ahead. So I think what we're getting now at Pentecost is for the future. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah. What, what are you guys seeing or what are you seeing on the future? Well, I see that even when the COVID-19 thing is gone, I mean, it's going to take years to recuperate from the economic mess. And when Chuck predicted this back at, at the beginning of the year, he said it's going to be plague-like things coming on the earth. But the main thing he felt like is it's going to be a time of belt tightening. It's going to be a time of economic distress. And I think in the long run, the economy is going to be a bigger problem than the, the pandemic. Um, so I don't think we're out of the woods yet as far as, you know, when, at the beginning of the year, we said that the world is just going to be in a mess. We're going to see, <laughs> see a mess. Yeah. But what, what God keeps speaking to us is harvest. Yes. You know, like this will be a time. People are so desperate to find reality, find something that works. And I believe there's going to be massive, massive harvest coming in. I believe we're going to see uh, uh, a, har a massive harvest in the homosexual community. Mm. has been speaking that to us uh we're, we're going to see harvest in among people that we never thought could get saved and uh i'd really you know it's sort of like the jesus movement when people got saved that didn't look look like christians or smell like christians or act like christians but they were madly and passionately in love with jesus yeah which, I, I, that's that's funny because i'm well, not funny but i think that's what i'm feeling I remember the Jesus movement. I got saved in the Jesus movement. I did myself. It was on the end of it, but I did get born again. I was in a Baptist church at that time, and it was very common in every service to have at least 50 people come to the Lord. That was just yep. the common thing that was happening. You didn't expect anything less. You thought you give an invitation, people are going to come forward. They're going to get saved. And yep. I think that, and it was real salvation. I, you know, it was not like it is today you know, pray this prayer so you don't go to hell. 
it was, they taught us that this is the price you're going to pay. This is what your life's going to be. Do you want to accept Jesus? And you did. And I, and I think that to me was a greater move because it, it was a real move. And we see people today, myself and others who were birthed out of that. And we're still at it. We didn't walk away from the faith. We're still going after the faith. And I, boy, you excite me when you say that, that we're going to see that level of a harvest. Well, that's because that's really my spiritual foundation with Jesus movement. And, you know, when you've been in that kind of revival dynamic, you just can't settle for church as usual. And I think probably every one of us that was in that ever since then have said, Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again. Lord, give us another chance. The church really did not receive what you were doing there. Lord, let us have a church that will receive what you're doing this time. And uh, I believe it's going. I believe that is that is where all of this will end up. We're going to see the harvest. Wow! And and we have to believe for that. I think uh, I've listened a lot to Lance Wall now and and Mario Murillo during this season as well. And some of the things that they are they've been saying and it's coming to true coming true is a lot of ministers and ministries should say prior to this they they didn't prophesy nor tell any of this was going to happen so when it happened then they tried to come and tell the answer to the problem the people were like no i'm not going to listen to what you say because you didn't even tell me this would ever happen and so what i see a, a shift in the body of christ where people are looking who has the word of the lord you know as in amos it talks about that people will wander for a lack of the word of god and I think this is a way of filtering that out. Who is carrying the word of the Lord? And for, you know, when this thing started, we were all looking, who's got the word? You know, we had our own, but we said, is somebody confirming what we have? Is there somebody? And so you would navigate through the, the mirage of all the different uh, speakers out there and come to that. Do you feel like there's been a filtering in this season? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think people are looking to see who saw this coming? And uh, I know for Chuck, you know, Chuck rarely speaks everything that he hears, but usually he'll get together, call the staff together and say, this is what I'm sensing. And a lot of what he gives, he would just wants for the intercessors to be praying through. And Chuck has never been a doom, or doom and gloom prophet, but starting about last September, he just started saying, you know, we're going to come into a very, very hard time. It's going to be just a whole series of uh, events, sort of like the plagues of Egypt. Uh, and, you know, we've seen the fires in Australia. We've seen the locust plague in Africa. We've seen COVID-19. And so it has been like that's just a whole series of things. And... Um, it was like he didn't spell a lot of it out in detail and a lot of it he never went public with. But it was like he saw what was coming. And that gives me confidence to know that, uh, that I can count on what he's, what he's hearing, what he's seeing. And God did say this, this, this would be a very difficult year. The world would be a mess. But uh, harvest is coming. Yeah, I remember it was back in January. Whenever he said, he said, "Put your seatbelt on." And I, yeah. I've been following Chuck long enough to know if he says that, it's about to be a rough ride. <laughs> and it and it was a rough ride, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, it, what it reminds me of is back in the early '90s, revival swept Argentina, and I got to go down there and see a lot of the stuff that was going on. And everybody in America was saying, oh, that is so wonderful. Lord, do in America what you did in Argentina. What they didn't realize is what put Argentina into revival was they lost the Falkland Island War. The country was humiliated. Their economy crashed. They went from a first world country to a third world country overnight. And when things got so bad, people said, let's turn to God. And it broke them through into revival. And I believe that's what's taking place now. 
Yeah, in Pensacola, I got involved in that revival. And, you know, everybody thought it was a Father's Day suddenly. But, you know, that was two years of intercession that yeah. Pastor Kilpatrick gave up. You know, he gave up service time and just said, we're just going to pray. You know, yeah. and they began to cry out. And he went through a suffering with his mom dying right before all that. And he was a broken man. And it just created this brokenness and this atmosphere for the Lord to come. And I always say a suddenly is never really a suddenly. It's just a moment in time where prophecy intersects with time. But, you know, day of Pentecost was prophesied way in the Old Testament about an outpouring. So Joel talked about it. Jeremiah talks about it. And so we know that it was a thousand years so of coming together before that happened. Um, I'm going to shift gears. We got about 10, five, 10 more minutes. Uh, I want to talk about your, your book also uh, about Messianic Church arising uh, because um, do you see, first of all, it was a phenomenal book. <laughs> Just, I wish I could, I try to give it to everybody. And you put it in plenty of languages now. So, and I travel the nations and I see that book everywhere. Uh, I think it was in your time to prosper that one too. I, I, I not forget this. I was in Italy in a bathroom somewhere and that book was in a bathroom, but anyway, <laughs> I uh, hope we're using it for toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just sitting there. I thought, wow, I didn't think I'd find this in Italy, but um, the messianic church arising, you, you know, you touch a lot of things. Cause a lot of people are scared of the messianic issue because they're afraid we're going to go back into legalism and the law, the kosher laws and all, how do we navigate through that? They, we, we miss some, we lost some of that, what the yeah. early church had of the gathering, the celebration of our times together. Uh, what do we need to do to some of those things? What do we need to do to get back to some of that? But do you see that coming in the church now? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm seeing that everywhere we go. Um, the problem is that wherever there are some that take the Jewish roots movement and turned it into legalism, but has put people back under the law. And that's never God's plan. Uh, God wants us to walk in the grace of the new covenant. But there were 2,000 years of revelation that God laid down to prepare a people to receive the Messiah. And uh, a lot of those things are things that God wanted for us. It was, he intended it as a blessing to us. And really, for the first four centuries, the church walked in those things, and they celebrated the feasts, they celebrated Shabbat. Uh, it wasn't until Constantine's time came that he outlawed all of the Jewish connections of the church, and the church lost a lot of things that God wanted us to have. And what we're seeing on our day, I think, is people are re God is bringing, God is restoring what has been stolen from us. And people are, um, the first time we celebrated the feasts, I really didn't have any idea how to celebrate the feast. We were just going to do it, as God said to you. People came up and said, this was wonderful. Why haven't we done this before? And every year when we celebrate the feast, new people coming in say that same thing. You know, we've never done this before. This was incredible. And it's, it's like they're designed to be something in us that nothing else will be. And God wants to meet with us at those times to, uh, to really do some spiritual transactions in our lives. So um, we don't want to go back under legalism. We don't want to get, we don't want to give up the freedom of the new covenant. But at the same time, there's a lot that's there that God had for us that was stolen away. And God wants to restore everything that we've lost. And I have to say, when I go to Glory Zion or watch you online, I see that there where the celebration, the dancing, the, you know, you guys did something. Y'all were doing that a long time before anybody else was. And I'll, I won't say who this prophet was, but we were on the front row. I was speaking at one of the conferences and it was going crazy, you know, at the front. <laughs> and he, he, he whispers over to me only at Glory of Zion. And, and, and his point was it's anointed there. And yet, if you do that somewhere else, the way it was going, it would not have that same weight because I think there was just a, a purity in the hearts of the dancers and everybody that was doing what they were doing there. And I think y'all have created a culture that is balanced in that area. 
where you're bringing back that messianic church. It's arising again. For me, I teach a lot to Jewish groups. I'm, I'm talking about secular Jewish communities. And uh, your book helped me a lot in, 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 for information on how to share because replacement theology came from Constantine onward. You know, it would have started there, the Nicene councils that you note in your book and everything. Those are important documents that we need to understand how the church moved us away. And for Jews, they don't like the Messianic movement because they say it's mainly Gentiles and he, they call them wannabe Jews. They just want to be Jews. And, uh, and it turns them off. It does not excite them toward the Lord. And so I think for us and what you guys are doing, when you love Israel and you love the Jewish faith and where we came from and you do it in a non-legalistic way, it speaks volumes to them. And that's what I, I've heard from Jewish community is that the way you guys are doing it, the way we try to do it as well is doing that. So I, I just encourage you to keep going after that. I want to thank you for that book. That book is so helpful to the body of Christ. You know, we have had uh, non-Messianic Jews come for the feast times because they enjoy what we're doing in glory of Zion. Uh, even though we know, they know that we honor Yeshua, Jesus as the Messiah, but they say there's life there. And uh, Yeah, I watched you had Rabbi Glick, is his name Rabbi Glick. I think he was there uh, a few months ago. Uh, I couldn't believe he was on the platform. I know who he is. <laughs> and I thought, wow, Chuck went after it. He went for it. And I think that was beautiful you know, that they share their heart. And I do that. I bring people from Israel who are not believers, but yet let this share their heart. And they are amazed at our environment. They yeah. just like, wow, I, I've had Jews tell me, non non-believer Jews say, look, I feel more at home here than I do in my own synagogue. And because we had a stronger faith than they're used to in the synagogue and, and understandably they don't have the Messiah. So we yeah. understand why that is true. So so moving toward uh, five, uh, eight one, do you have any clues what's going to happen at eight one? <laughs> Can we be headed up for next year? Um, I think it'll still be, you know, this whole decade is the decade of the mouth. So we'll still have to pay, but then God will add ah. things to it in there. And I'll let you know when I find out. Okay. Well, I tried. I tried, spoiler alert, I tried to get some, some information, but he didn't give us any. That's okay. Um, so, I mean, are you feeling good? I will we'll close with this. How, how, why don't you speak to the body of Christ? Just encourage those that are listening tonight. Those that watch on the replay, we honor everybody that's tuned in tonight, but also the replay uh, just to encourage the church where we're going after this Pentecost, because I think everybody's targeting Pentecost right now, because that's where the prophetic is. Yeah. but I don't hear much conversation on what's going to happen after Pentecost other than the harvest and an outpouring. Well, that's wonderful. But if hard times come, et cetera, come along the way, we need insight. So why don't you just encourage about it and we'll close with this tonight. Okay. Let me put it this way. One of my favorite movies is Apollo 13 hmm. about they, they were launched to the moon and the ship blew up and they were really didn't look like they were going to bring them back alive. And as they're, nearing the end of this and one problem after another comes up there were two of the uh, leaders in the control room that were saying you know this could happen this could happen this could happen and the other guy was saying yeah this could be the greatest disaster nasa has ever experienced jane krantz the flight director turned and looked at them and said i believe this is going to be our finest hour mm. And I think that is what I would say to the church now. This is not a time to walk in fear. It's not a time to uh, listen to what the world is saying. The world is in a mess. Everything around us is shaking, but we stand on a solid foundation. And I believe this will be the church's finest hour. I believe in future years, we will look back on this year and say, this is the time when it all changed. This is the time when revival broke out and it will change the world. That's, I believe that's where we're headed. And I think you should listen to what Dr. Heidler is saying there. It's very important for me. You know, I'm, I'm still in my fifties, barely, but um, when I get on an airplane or go to a doctor's office, I love gray hair. I like to look in that cockpit and see gray hair. And I like to sit in my doctor's office because I want to know they have experience and, 
And so I think in these times, when things are shaking, the church looks at the older generation and say, are they scared? Are, are, are they okay? Because we're like barometers, the older generation is right now. If they're okay, then we're okay. And I think that's one thing you guys have demonstrated and just being wise and going through so many things in your life. And I imagine I looked at your bio, you've been through enough. You were in, uh, I know what kind of theology you grew up under and then to get into the prophetic movement. I don't know how you did that. Going from Dallas Theological to the Spirit-Filled Movement, because that, those are diametrically right. different. <laughs> How'd that happen? Um, God got tired of us resisting the Holy Spirit, <laughs> put us through a year from hell, and we were just ready to give up on everything. And then a friend of ours came and prayed for us. And he was charismatic, and he didn't say you just need to speak in tongues. But he came and he prayed for us and then he left and we went to bed that night and we were still bitter and angry at god we felt you know we tried christianity we tried all this it hasn't worked we woke up the next morning and the holy spirit had invaded our house we had praise songs flowing through us we couldn't wait to pray and get get with the lord and about three days later linda and i both spoke in tongues on the same day we didn't tell each other what had happened because we, I had taught against that for many years, but we knew it was God, and we've just been having fun ever since. Wow, what a, and that's what the Holy Spirit can do, right? He can change in that moment. You know, we're 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 eating on a war. Go ahead. Okay, the introduction of my book, Experiencing the Spirit, has the whole testimony. Okay. And also, I meant to ask you on your Iona series, uh, you'd mentioned on one of your teachings recently that this is a word for now. Would you agree with that? I want you to oh, speak to that right now and the books that you have. There's three of them, right? Yeah, it's uh, Iona Portal, uh, Iona Stronghold, uh, and Iona Rising, written under the pen name Robert David McNeil. It's a fiction book about spiritual warfare. But I've had many, many people say, Reading those books, I understood spiritual warfare for the first time. And I think it really is a crucial book for, crucial book for this hour because we are in warfare. And we need to understand the issues. We need to understand our enemy. We need to understand our allies. And uh, those books are designed to give you a picture of that. And, uh, and they can just go to the Gloria Zion bookstore. It's online, GloriaZion.com. Dot org and you can and you can get those there and uh, also, you, on amazon as well everything's on amazon yeah <laughs> we, can, we can probably buy dr robert heidler on amazon <laughs> everything is there but uh you know we're running with a word right now dr heidler the lord gave me a word this last week it said that our enemies on the run pursue and recover all that's what i heard <laughs> And yes. I really felt like you know one thing I studied about war is when an enemy's on the run it's in confusion and what the Lord showed me, if we don't pursue right now, it'll just reorganize and try to come back. And that's what a retreating army does. It tries to go gather at one spot, get their plan together and come back for another attack. We have got to get him on the run and pursue and recover everything right now. So I think we are in a critical moment. Would you agree with that? Yeah. It's a time to move forward. Amen. We have the book. That's probably backwards oh. on your camera there. So... <laughs> That's what they look like. Uh, if you, I know when you look at a camera, it's always backwards, but um, I encourage you to go get those. Those are great books by Dr. Heidler. Well, thank you, Dr. Heidler, for coming tonight. Our people are going to be blessed. They're so excited. Uh, we connect so much with Glory Zion and you giving us your time tonight. We pray a blessing on you and upon uh, your ministry and what you're doing there. Thank you for your teaching. I think you're one of the most superior teachers in the country and the world, really of releasing revelation. You have given me hope that, that the prophetic and the teaching gift can flow together. And you've done that. And you guys are wonderful for what you do. So thanks for coming on tonight. Well, thank you so much. And God just returned those blessings to you, to your ministry, to each one that's listening. Uh, we're coming into great times. Amen. And it's going to be okay. Amen. Well, you take that word from Dr. Heidler. We bless you tonight. We ask that God be with you. Uh, we look forward to this weekend. We're going to have a, our Sunday meeting. Please go online and register. We need to know how many people are coming. So we love each one of you. Thank you. And God bless. We'll see y'all again on Sunday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.